Welcome to another BritFlix podcast. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guest is filmmaker Reese Evanashen. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Max out of 10, I'm pronouncing your surname. Absolutely. Yep, I love it. Thank you very much. I'm glad I got it right. We're here to talk about three films that have impacted everything in your adult life. But first, yep. let's talk about you as a filmmaker. You work with a good friend of mine and a friend of the show, Avi Fedegreen. And you're what, head of development, is it? Is that your Head of t- development, that's right. Head of development at what company? Uh, at uh, Fetter Green Entertainment. Brilliant. So do you want to give us a brief picture as to what Fetter Green Entertainment are up to right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this year specifically, we just completed production back in April on a feature film, which was a passion project of, of Avi's yeah. uh, called Home Free. And it's a pretty big, uh, you know, deviation from what we usually do because we do a lot of genre fare. So it was our first time uh, kind of dipping in and doing a much larger, broader drama. Um, And it was an interesting experience because it wasn't something that I was necessarily involved with. It had been a project that had been in development for about eight years prior. Okay. Um, And then finally, it just came to fruition that we were able to get it made. And I was brought in just this year in January to take over as the screenwriter. And I had to completely rewrite the script oh my word. before we started filming. So the start date was set. And I had to start writing the script knowing that we had to start shooting in March. No it pressure was, then, Reese. No pressure. No pressure whatsoever. It was a little bit like uh, trying to build a train while you're on the tracks. Wow. So, you know, wow. Heading towards the destination. So um, so I'm, I'm curious. I, it was Listen, it was a great experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything because I've never had anything like that yeah. where I could just focus on being the writer on set, mm-hmm. um, getting to work alongside so close with Abby, who's a good friend of mine in that cast and the wonderful producers and team we had. So yeah, I'm excited to see how that turned out. That was sort of our, our, our big venture. And uh, I mean, right now we're just on the lookout for other feature films, other properties. It's... Um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. It's it'll be a year that I've been head of development as of this August. So, brilliant. Now, you first came to my attention um, as the writer director of For the Sake of the Vicious, yeah. Yes, correct. Yep. And that played at Fright Fest, which is where I saw it. Amazing. I I loved the film very much, and I wrote nice words about it, uh, which you may or may not have read. And <laughs> one of the things that um, one of the things that impressed me most was how much you got out of what was essentially a one location. But before we yep. get into that, do you want for the for the benefit of those that don't know the film, sure. Do you want to give a brief synopsis to what for the sake of the vicious is about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean it's about a uh, it's about a nurse who just worked finished working a double shift. It's Halloween night. Uh she gets home, she's getting ready to get settled in to go pick up her kid to get her night started, and she finds a stranger in her kitchen with another person, a hostage, completely tied up in the kitchen with her. And she has no idea why they're there, no information whatsoever. And then it just unfolds from there. Why has this guy got this other guy hostage? What's the scenario behind this? For the first half of the movie, you almost think you're watching a procedural kind of courtroom drama set in this house where they're trying to deal with this conflict. And she's monkey in the middle, essentially playing the jury. And then at the halfway point, it does a 180 on you and it turns into a movie that you didn't even expect it to become. It becomes this intensely violent home invasion action horror thriller, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I'm just I'm just checking over my notes now, what I wrote, and in my final paragraph, I I I um I summarize by saying, for the sake of the vicious dazzles with intensity, it never takes its proverbial foot off the audience's throat. Yeah. Was uh, was how I and like you say, that isn't where you think you start. But certainly, yeah. it's where you finish. Um, yeah. Now, using a one location and using a real location instead of a studio. Yes. From a filmmaker point of view, what do you remember being like a like a crucial challenge to overcome in terms of that kind of constraint, but also that kind of opportunity? Well, I mean, it was in a way yes, in a way no. Like we knew we were right, so it was written with my partner in the film. It was it was Gabriel Carrere who co-directed it with me. It was mm. his story originally, yeah. And he had just brought me on to write it at first. Okay, I had no, I I actually had no interest in doing any more directing. I had kind of reached a, <laughs> I was like, I had had not such a, I had made a movie prior to this. That was like a sci-fi B movie opus that I was very proud of. Right, and I wrote and directed it. 
And it came out in 2017 and Stuart, it tanked, like royally tanked. The reviews were awful. It didn't very, it didn't do very well. And it just kind of came and went. And I put so much hope and faith into it. I thought it was going to be the thing. And it just wasn't. And I, it, it really, it really hurt me. I, you know, and it was just one of those like, well, I did it and I got it. You're only human. Yeah. So when Gabe came to me with, for the sake of vicious, I was like, I'll just write it for you. I want nothing to do with it. And then all of a sudden I was co-directing it. I was on set and away we were going and it kickstarted a whole new course direction for me, which I've been on ever since. So I'm very grateful that I stuck around and did it. But back to your question, I mean, the house itself, we wrote it for the house originally because the script was so specific in its in its stage direction. Yeah. For the longest time, we had fully intended on building the whole house as a set because it was written for a bungalow, just a one level house. And that and that would be a normal approach for this type of film, yeah, wouldn't it? Exactly. And and we were so close, even when we were in pre-production. We had the production designer attached. I had the space, I had the studio space. We were getting ready to build. And then at the last minute. For his own reasons, the production designer backed out of the production. And that's fine. It was a low-budget film. I get it. They had to take something else, no harm, no foul. But we found ourselves in a situation where it's like, well, then we have to find a house. Like, there's just no other way. And I managed to have a connection through my dad, of all people, who had helped out a local business who had now like a flourishing contracting company. And he called them on a whim, and I got them on the phone. I said, we start in a month. This is the scenario. I said, I need a house that I can destroy. And just to my pure luck, they had just purchased a piece of property that they were going to tear down in two months and build two different houses. No. And they said, you can have it for a very low fee and you can do whatever you want to the house. And I said, no, no, wait a minute. I said, I need to know that when you say that, you mean that. Because I'm like, we are going to destroy this house. Like I said, there's gunshot, fights, everything. We're going to destroy this place. They said, no, you have our word. So, yeah, because I was going to say, there's, 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 there's for, for once you invite a film crew into your house, yes. even when it's not a violent revenge movie. Yeah, oh, it's a the, disaster no matter what you yeah. do. Yeah, even on a drama, as we just had in, in April. So, um, they gave us the keys to the house and we we're off to the races. And I'm like, it's, it's incredible that it came together that fast. It, it was a little tricky at first because the house was obviously a completely different layout from everything that we had been rehearsing mm. and practicing. So we really had to kind of put our heads together in those last couple of weeks before we shot and sort of rethink the action. Yeah, yeah, because right. thinking about it, a bungalow is a single-story building, whereas you That's clearly right. go upstairs and downstairs in the, in the yeah. official version. Yeah, and, and it's great because it actually gave us way more suspense and way more room to play with. It was a tiny... The thing that doesn't come across in the movie, I don't think, is the house looks massive to me in the movie. When you're in the house, like it is so incredibly small. You know? <laughs> is this, like if you could, and, and there was, you know, we didn't have a big, like it wasn't a big budget film. We had one trailer outside, but everybody had to share the house. So pretty much whenever the camera's filming, so just picture 14 or 15 people like jammed into a room. Well, well, I'm going to say the bit, the bit that sticks in the memory and which is no mistake in the, the constraints of size you're working with is the sequence in the bathroom. Yes, of course. Yeah. So do you, want, do you want to talk us through kind of how you prep for something like that? And how long does that sequence take to even get into the camera? 100%. I mean, the bathroom was our set piece. Mm. In the script, it was always the favorite part of anybody who read it. Yeah. Um, when we got to the house, the actual bathroom was incredibly small. Very, very small. Like mm-hmm. Barely walking room. It was just toilet, sink, shower. Yeah. Um, but what was next to it was a spare bedroom. So we looked at the spare bedroom and we said, we're going to make one set. Let's build this set. So we ripped up the carpet. We went to a secondhand store. We bought the giant clawfoot tub because I wanted that specifically by the window for the action. Hmm. We got a toilet. We got a sink. We installed it. We put it in. We painted the floor. Got the camera department to put in all the lights. Um, And we shot it in one very long 20-hour day, which was awful. We, we had talked, we had prepped. The stunt team went in that morning. They walked through the entire fight with us. They got the cast in there. We rehearsed the fight for probably six or seven hours. And then we just shot it. Boom, 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 boom. As, as, as intense as it is to watch, it was, pro- it was almost that intense filming it. Oh, right. Because it was just myself, 
and the two camera operators and the cast in the room. Mm -hmm. I was behind the one camera camera operator A, and I was moving him around to get the shots I wanted, while camera B was doing the same. So the three of us were moving in this weird motion, and the the sound recordist just set up mics in the ceiling, so they were out of out of reach. Yeah, yeah. but um, it was intense to film. It was very. It was like when you watch it in the movie. We were all jammed in there. It felt like we were all part of the fight. So I was I was pleased that it came together as well. Because sometimes when you shoot these things, you know, you see it on set and you go, oh, this is going to be great. And then you watch it in the edit and you go, oh my God, this is awful. Um, but luckily it turned out as intense and as sweaty and as vicious as it really was on the day. So Indeed. And, and then, so that, in that sense, then, what was the challenges of all that footage you'd got in turning it into what we see on the film? There were no challenges. It was it was great because okay. I had shot action before. So the trick to me for shooting action is you do it in in segmented chunks. Okay. So you just shoot the parts you want to get. So rather than doing like one long master of shooting an entire three minute long fight scene, we break it down into I think it was ten sections. So we just go okay, section one, let's shoot it. We practice section one, we mm. get it perfect. You shoot it, great. Section one is done. Section two, section two is done. And you just move on down the line. So when I get to my editing bay, it's already broken down in those sections. Um, and you just have, all I did was shoot the shots that we needed. So in a way, you're kind of using the the, the sort of engine of the transition because you've, you've yeah. broken it down. It, yes. it sort of jumps to the next action because of the nature of how you've shot it. Without, yes, exactly. So the idea of continuity doesn't matter as much because it's no, about the lurching should, around, isn't it? Yeah, ah, exactly. Okay, okay, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Well, and congratulations. Editor, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. But as an editor, the trick to it too is like, I know what I need in the edit. Ah, okay. So I just shot what we needed. So when it got into the edit, it was, it was actually, honestly, that whole film was one of the easiest films I've ever edited before. It came together incredible. I think I did it in less than a month. And that, that first version we showed, our rough cut, is not much different than the one that's released. Was now. was there was there any sort of new story development that came out of the edit? Was anything anything new discovered out of it that you that you needed to move around? Yeah, I mean, we went and reshot a couple quick little things to add in, but yeah. for the most part, I mean, it pretty much was what it was. I mean, because of the nature of how small the production was, unfortunately, we had to cut a lot of stuff as we were going. Mm -hmm. So I think the movie, rightfully so, I've seen critics point out, it's got some plot holes, and I'm like. I fully acknowledge that. I'm like, because we had no other choice. Yeah. We had to chop stuff as we were going and we kind of did our best to piece it together as we shot it. So I think it's the best possible version of that movie given the circumstances that we had making it. In a way though, it's, it's you know, it's 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 cousins are films like Assault on Precinct 13 and things like that, aren't they? Yeah. Where, where it's, it's about the culmination of everything. It's not necessarily about how immaculately plotted it might be or not be. We kind of go with the energy. Well, yeah, and, and the whole idea, too, for me, was that you're just supposed to be dropped into the story with the main character. Yeah. And she has no idea what's going on. Mm. And that was the experience that we wanted from the whole beginning. It's like, we just wanted you to experience this as she was. Mm. You wouldn't know what was going on. You wouldn't know. What's, in fact, we give the I think we give the audience even too much information. I'm like, I wanted it to be completely unexplained. <laughs> like, just, do, do you remember in that, in that saying then, do you remember what, what was the kind of kernel of the idea for Gabriel's original story that, that led to the film we see today? Um, it was, it was that idea of, it was the hostage situation. That's where the, the, the kernel of the idea was. Right. And then I think I brought in the sort of home invasion thriller and the kind of crime procedural aspect to it. Got so, you. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, look, I was a big fan of that film. Still, I'm a big fan of that film. Congratulations on it. it. And I'm Thank happy I've got a chance to speak to you about it. But now we're going to move on to um, three films that have impacted yes, we are. everything in adult life. Without further ado, and in the order that you gave me them in, um, the, the first film on your list is written and directed by James Cameron. It is 1984's The Terminator. Do you want to talk us through how you come across this film, where you see it, who you see it with, et cetera, et cetera? Absolutely. So, uh, first off, my name is Reese, and I was named after Kyle Reese in The Terminator. Really? Yeah. You're off to so, a flyer already. You're off to a flyer already with that one. Yeah. So, so my mom and dad, neither one will give each other. I don't know who they both say it was their idea. So I'm not <laughs> sure whose idea was at the end. 
So the Terminator has been there since the day I was born. I was born in 86. So it was two years after it came out. Okay. And um, it was introduced to me just on the very nature of like, you are named after this character. And you have to remember, and I know you do, this was a time when it was socially acceptable to show kids a movie like the Terminator, you know? Um, and especially if you'll remember the Terminator 2 specifically, Judgment Day, uh, was almost marketed towards kids. Um, you know, they had toy lines and everything. In toy comics. companies didn't seem to see the line between what was an R rated film and what was uh, what was what was a kid's toy, did they? Exactly. So I had watched both of those films at an incredibly young age. My uncle uh, had specifically bought me the VHS uh, double hitter, like two collector of Terminator One and Terminator Two. Mm. Uh, now, admittedly, you know, when I was young, and I think this is fair to say, you know, Terminator 2 was always the one I went to because, you know, it's the spectacle, it's the action yeah. movie, it's the big one. But Terminator, the first one, especially as the years have gone by, has been the one that resonates with me the most. Not just because of the obvious connection to the name, more and more as I get older, what, a, what an expertly crafted film that is. Um, and, you know, as a screenwriter, and I'm sure you would agree, I, I think the one thing that gets overshadowed about it or not talked about enough is how ruthlessly efficient James Cameron's screenplay for The Terminator is. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, like, it's... I mean, it, it, we, we, we don't have enough time to get into it, but, I mean, even if you want to fair, focus on the bare bones of... You know, he, he was the master at delivering exposition. I You know, there's a good, what, 30, 30 40 minutes of that film where... As the audience, if you had no idea watching it for the first time, you don't know that Arnold Schwarzenegger is a robot. You have no idea. Mm. And it isn't until the techno-war sequence when Kyle shoots him a bunch of times and then he sits back up and he's chasing them in the alley and you see the red vision going. You're like, what the hell is this? And then through the course of a car chase, that's not only a car chase, but it's a shootout. And then a holdout in, in the middle of a parking lot and then a chase with uh, the police. Michael Bean's character gives us all this exposition that in any other circumstance would be incredibly boring to listen to. But it is so thrilling because it's through a car chase and they're getting shot at and they're getting chased and he's dumping all this information on you and you're so connected to Sarah Connor as a character because you're that character watching the film. You're seeing it through their eyes that you're going, yeah, okay, shit, I'd go along with this. And he does all the beats that I think you would go along with as well, mm. like the misquestioning of it. You know, she asks all the right questions that you would in that situation. And he gives all the perfect answers that as a, as a writer, it's a great throwaway because he doesn't have all the answers. So he doesn't have to give you all the answers. Like I love when he's getting interrogated by the cops and they're trying to ask him about the time machine. And he goes, I don't know. I didn't build the fucking thing. <laughs> and I'm like, as a writer, I'm like, that's a great throwaway line because I would have no, I would, I wouldn't know how to explain the stupid thing either. So, well, yeah, I was going to say because one of the one of the key things the film does is two is two things is it lets us imagine a dystopian future we've never seen. Yes, and it has to get that across, or else yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah, and it's got time travel, so it's like yeah. there's a double whammy going on there that's tough for any screenwriter to sort of bring to the table without too much talking yes 100 percent. and i and i think probably the biggest thing i take away from it is like inspiration moving forward on other projects or just the thing that i connect to the most is is going back to the idea of sarah connor which is this and you know it's kind of the fundamental rule for most great films it's it's an ordinary character that's been thrust into extraordinary situations you know like, I love that perspective. We were just talking about it with the For the Sake of Vicious, mm. where you have a character who is so removed from the scenario you're about to throw them in. There's just something that's so much easier to connect to as an audience member when you're watching a film like that. You know, it's, it's, it's hard sometimes when you go in and the character, you know, your lead character knows everything already or they've been through this situation and you're playing catch up. Whereas Sarah Connor's character, I'm like, oh, there we go. Go on, finish your thoughts. Sarah Connor's character, what? Well, you're 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 sent, you're along for the ride with her. You're learning all the information with her. You're you're getting the dazzle, the spectacle, everything, the wow factor. I just again, I think it's ruthlessly efficient screenwriting, and it's it's impressive that he did that back then before he became what he is now. You know? So. Yeah, yeah, as well because as well because James Cameron's responsible for two two of the greatest sequels, isn't he? You know, T two and Aliens. But right, and then. 
Yeah. And then, and I think even, I mean, this is a whole other conversation, but I'm like, Way of the Water, too, just proves that I'm like, he's still great at writing sequels. So, what I was, was going to say was that the, 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 the thing with Alien and Terminator as first films is that they have that ability to give us an everyday character that's going to get thrown into something that we can put ourselves in. When you get to the second ones, you know, Sarah Connor is this ripped. That's right. Military precision machine now that is fighting a dystopian future that she's trying to avoid the yes. world getting into. Whereas the first yes. one, it's mom, what do we do now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So it's yeah. Anyway, Terminator. Good I man, good man. Great story. Great story. Thanks for sharing that. So moving two years on to the year you were born, Day of the Dead, written and directed by George Romero. Do you wanna yeah. so what age so what age are you then when this is when this is brought to the table? Uh, I think I saw Day of the Dead when I was seven years old. Okay. Uh, this is back in the day of the mom and pop video stores, the independently run video stores. Okay. You know, where you could just walk in and freely browse any section. And, you know, I, I knew nothing about zombies, I don't think, at that age. I had no frame of reference for it. Um, and for some reason, that original box art cover sitting on the shelf, uh, you know, it had a yellow background with the zombies, but Bub was the most prominent character on the front. Indeed is. And I remember the tagline was like, first he brought us night, then it was dawn, and now day of the dead. And there was just something about that box art that I was found so incredibly intriguing that I rented it at the age of seven. They let me rent it, you know? I don't even think they knew what it was. And I remember sitting down and watching that for the first time um, it was at my mother's boyfriend's house. She had been divorced at this point. Yeah. And she had dropped me off there. I don't know why I was staying there. It doesn't matter. But I remember I had McDonald's in front of me. And I sat down to watch this film that I had no frame of reference for. And it starts off with the hands coming through the wall. And you're like, okay, that's interesting. And then it has this opening scene in Florida. They land. He's calling out, hello. You're seeing all this like, you know, the world's in ruins. You're going, what the hell's going on? And then it cuts to that shot of the ground and the music starts picking up and you just see a silhouette of the shadow moving. And then it cuts to this shot looking up and it's back against the sun. And there's this fucking zombie missing its lower half, its tongue hanging out, blood dripping. And then it looks up and the title goes, Day of the Dead. Let me tell you, Stuart, at seven years old, having never experienced anything like that, that's the one thing in my life. I'm like, that moment changed my life forever. Forever. I was obsessed with special makeup effects from that point on. I wanted to know everything about Tom Savini, everything about George Romero, everything about that film. Like that movie to me was a groundbreaking moment in my life and still continues to be. I mean, my love of zombie movies is insane. I love zombie films. My first film ever was a zombie film. But Dave the Dead has always resonated, not only, and I love the original three, mm. Night, Dawn, and I know Dawn is usually everybody's favorite, and I, I like them all equally pretty much, but Day of the Dead is the is the crowning achievement for me. I think it's... Well, I, I was going to say... I, I mean, mean, technically... Yeah, I was going to say, technically, it, it kind of delivered on the go that the that the world was ready to see, and it, and it really went to town on it. Plus, as well, yes. it's... It's the first one that feels like a genuine sequel. You could, you could, you could maybe plot yeah. a timeline from where the end of Dawn of the Dead goes to shit, and then picking yeah. up the thread with a new bunch of people, because yes. the, the Dawn of the Dead sort of tackles that idea of there's a zombie invasion or a zombie takeover, whereas yeah. Night of the Living Dead is is ambiguous as to the origins. You know, that's you, right. Yeah, it's just yeah. there are it just it just have to accept that the dead of, of the dead have come to life. Yeah, and. And the other thing too, especially again, as I get older, what I really appreciate is that it's this, this really dark and brooding, essentially Shakespearean drama in a cave, you know, mm. it's got these epic monologues. And I know people like to kind of heard a lot of people sort of trash the acting in the film as being too over the top, blah, blah, blah. I think it works perfectly for the kind of film that he makes. Cause I always thought George Romero was a, he was very theatrical with his films. And I mm. think that one, suits his 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 dialogue the best because if you actually look at the words that are being said in that film i think it's some incredibly intelligent writing like just some of the breakdowns of you know even when um sarah's talking to john and they're outside the trailer and he's just talking about what's the point of all this why are we doing this you know what 
this we're trying to chase this thing that doesn't exist. You know, we should just enjoy what we have for what it is. And I've always loved that because I'm like, that's just a perfect explanation for everything we have in life. You know, you're chasing this problem instead of just dealing with, well, it is what it is. Let's just accept it and move on. There's something about that that's always latched on to me. Um, I think it's a great character study. And I love that he went from, I like that each film is so drastically different from the other two. Yeah. Like Night is this very classic gothic horror film. Dawn is a comic book. And Day is this very brooding, dark, I mean, in a way, and I've not thought about this till till this conversation. Day is hugely influential on the original Twenty Eight Days Later because, big time, because big of time. the idea of what happens when the military try and take over in in a, in a free country like America, and obviously in Twenty Eight Days in a country like oh, there we go again. That's yep. fun. There's our five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> it flies by, doesn't it? It flies by. But I mean, just just to add, I I, I I'd never. Th- Watching it when I, I mean, I got, I was, I'm a bit older than you, and I saw this as a 10, 12, 12 year old. When, okay. when, when, oh, maybe a bit older, um, when it came out, and it was one we watched a lot from the video shops. Right. And then it wasn't until watching it, like being a screenwriter, that I realized what a brilliant exercise it was in, in a contained horror film because. Absolutely. I always thought of it as being a big, a big film, you know, and I think that's that little trick of like out in Florida, helicopter coming in, going under, and you really don't leave the basement after that. And that's kind of, and obviously Night of the Living Dead is the exemplar of, you know, everybody, everybody with no budget has tried to try and emulate yes. Night of the Living Dead. And obviously Dawn yes. of the Dead has a shopping mall, which was just a beautiful yeah. set piece, yeah. but it's a huge playground. Whereas the the underground bunker is a, yeah, it's like we build these things to keep us safe, but actually, you know, what the, what's the point if you're just locked underground forever? There's no, it's not living, is it? And no, and that was a beautiful part of Day of the Dead. No, and it also, I think it it laid the groundwork for what it could have been some really interesting storylines for zombie films moving forward. But I don't think anybody really tried. I know he tried to do it with the other three films, and I mean, I still appreciate them, but I I don't know. There's something about Day that's very special. Because was was it land after was it land after Day of the Dead? It was land after a day. Yeah. So that's twenty years later. Yes. Yeah. And also that was his first studio film, which he got burnt yes. by. And, yes. And then he went back to his sort of indie film roots, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think he, I think he got it back. But uh, yeah, but they're always interesting because he's and it, what what I love about it more than anything else is that a guy who makes a film in what nineteen sixty nine sets yes. the rules for a genre like. Like, like Bram Stoker did with a book about Dracula. I know it's like insane. Who, who can? I know, like, who can claim? Like his his legacy is every zombie film from now on is his film was the blueprint. Yes, yeah, yeah. the original three films, like they kickstarted an entire genre that keeps going to this day. It's brilliant. So. Right. Well, shift in tone very di- into a different world now. Big shift. Yes. A big shift. The next five minutes, we're going to talk about. Hedwig and the Angry Inch from 2001, written directed by John Cameron Mitchell. Tell yes. us where what what this impact is, how where you saw this, how okay, you saw well, it. Okay, well, I'll tell you this: I saw it firsthand because I was on set for the entire shoot. Okay, wowza! So when I was, oh boy, this was 2000 when they shot it. Yeah, so I would have been 13. My this shot in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Okay. Uh, and my mom worked on the film. She was a part of the locations department and no. she was working on film for years. Um, and this was at a point, it's funny because now working in film, I'm like, I do this week, you'd never get away with this. But she would just bring me to set because <laughs> she knew I loved film. So Hedwig was one of those shows where she brought me to set. And I ended up, I would help out. I would just be like this non-union young volunteer on these sets, either helping her or helping other departments. In the case of Hedwig and the Angry Inch, I ended up working alongside the craft department. I worked in the Okay, okay. So you weren't just sat in the corner with a Game Boy. You were you were you were able to no, just sort I of... actually worked. I was making meals, putting stuff together. I was helping my mom with the locations department. I was on for probably 90% of that shoot. And that was a one of the best summers I've ever had. And especially as somebody, you know, who was loved film, was obsessed with filmmaking, specifically genre films at that age, 
But to go on to a set like that, mm. at that age, summer 2000, Toronto, Ontario, like that was a life-changing experience in the sense of just seeing, oh, this is a real film. Like watch how this is being made and the theatricality of what John was doing with his story. And also at the time, like, it's funny to see how it's become such a thing now, Hedwig. Like, mm. it's, you know, it became a Broadway play. It's a well respected it's gone criterion for God's sakes. But back then it was this little tiny independent film being shot in Toronto that nobody really knew what it was. Nobody really cared. It felt like we we're all part of this weird artsy independent experiment. And he shot so many different scenes that we were there for that are so wild and out there that aren't even in the movie. Like there was this whole subplot of Andrew Martin's character having a cell phone built inside her head like, <laughs> that she controlled with her teeth. So to witness that, to witness the, the camera work being done, to witness, you know, being a part of these amazing sets and these costumes and these characters and just having this, this access to it as a kid, nobody questioned it. You know, I was around the cast all the time. I was around the crew all the time. The ADs, the DP, the director, just to have that unprecedented access to see that world in such an adult story. It's less about, I really like the movie. I do. I, I love it. And I love the music. and But a lot of that is informed by my experience of being there that summer. Understandably so when so, I yeah. watch the movie, it's like my own little time machine to kind of go back to that summer and be like, I was there. I experienced that. I was a part of that. You know, obvi there, obviously there was a whole crew there that did way more work. They put the movie together. My, I added like 0.01% effort into what I could as, as a 13 year old, just providing some food. And I spun some fancy disco lights, but um, that, that changed a lot of things for me. And I remember even back then there was a very young filmmaker on set who was a, uh, we have the director's guild of Canada, who is a DGC trainee. Hmm. And I had a script back then I'd written like a 60 page script, which was probably God awful. <laughs> but this young man read the script for me on the set. And gave me all these wonderful notes. And it ended up being Brad Payton, who directed San Andreas and like Rampage with The Rock. Seriously. And produced all these TV series. So it's it's pretty cool. I mean, yeah, Hedwig, man, it was that was an experience. And I, I still live with that. That's why I always put it on that list because again, just the feeling of being on set, being with those people, having that experience for the first time and seeing how a film really comes together. Yeah. Especially a musical. And seeing kind of the ins and outs of how they made such a small budget be this big, massive story they were trying to tell. Um, yeah, it was. I was even there. I got. I was invited to the very first like cast and crew screening in Toronto. At it was at. I was at a post house. It was a tiny, tiny little screening house. And yeah, man, it was. It was pretty wild. It was. It was cool. I have a lot, a lot of fond memories of that movie. So it means a lot to me. It's very important. I imagine, I imagine. Now, what, what it begs the question, because obviously someone growing up in Toronto, and Toronto is a location that's used as America a lot. Yes. How often does a film, does, do you get taken out of a film the minute you recognise it's Toronto? When... All the time. <laughs> All the time. Because I, I, oh, there we go. Because I, I, I don't think it's... Um... It must be the bane of Toronto filmmakers to, to be watching a movie and go... Oh, that's just around the corner from where I'm sat. It is because there's especially with TV shows, you're like, oh, Toronto, oh, Toronto, yeah. Um, and the Resident Evil series is notorious for that. Okay, where you just especially the first, like, well, not the third one, but the the end of the first, the second one, the fourth, and the fifth one, you're like, it's just all Toronto. That's all I see. And also, you know, Toronto, in my opinion, it doesn't really look like an American city. Uh, you know, I've been to America a lot. Well, obviously, it's right next door to us. Mm. And it's just a very specific vibe and look that America has that I'm like, it's you can't, Canada just does not capture it. I think there are some parts of Canada that have American vibes to it, but whatever. I don't think anybody else notices other than Canadians. No, you must. I was, I, 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 it, just, it just dawned on me as you were describing it, thinking, yeah, that, that's kind of, because because I'm guessing the, the, the tax breaks must be better and all that kind of stuff, which is what the, they are. the temptation is and to go north. That's why we always love, you know, that David Cronenberg's movies just embrace that they were in Toronto. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't like point a finger and say, hey, it's Canada. You know, it's just, mm. oh, it's Toronto. And it is just, there's the CN Tower, you know. All these other films try and hide every possible Canadian landmark. <laughs> and Cronenberg's just like, no, it's Canada. So I'm guilty of it too. I, I When we're making movies, I, 
I don't know, for some reason, I just think it's so uncool for a story to be set in Canada. <laughs> and I'm a proud Canadian. I, there's just, you know, I don't know. There's something about that American ethos. There's, it's almost like a, a fantasy or something about it that you that's just more appealing in a cinematic language. So. It's like it's like Jitan cigarettes compared to the ones you can buy in your on your heart. It's much more exotic to be foreign. Um, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Well, look, uh, we've come to the end of your three films that have impacted everything adult life, and I'm very grateful for the stories you've shared and the memories. Um, is there anything you want to anything you got coming up in the future that you want to point out to? Um. Well, I mean, it's kind of like. Well, first off, thank you for having me on the show. I My really pleasure. Appreciate it. The pressure to pick those three titles was incredibly intense mm -hmm. because it's not like you're picking your, they're your favorite films, but it's almost like asking somebody to pick your top five favorite films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is nearly impossible because there's so many good films. So to pick three, I just had to more channel like a, uh, well, what do they mean to me now? What do I think? And that's kind of what, story? that's what I want, because yeah. I, I don't want to do the, the, the sort of subjective, these are the best films I've ever seen because. Films are about to me. Films become a personal biography. Films become memories, and and sometimes you can watch a film and only watch it once, but that memory of it, yes, is perfect. And you know, woe betide you if you go back and rewatch it because you completely ruin a memory that you've got of something. You know, and that's kind of that's a magical thing that it that, is. That the further you get away from something, the more it, the more it gels as a memory of your life. But actually, it is. You can go back and watch it and completely revise your thought. You thought of that memory, but equally, you can watch a film with your grandfather. You can see your film. You can be on set with your mother, and suddenly a yeah. film is elevated to somewhere else other that's than right. just seeing a movie. So that's kind of what it's all about. So I'm grateful for what you talked about. I love the I love the reason for Terminator. That is not what <laughs> I was expecting. So that's why I love doing the podcast. Well, there so, we go. Well, it just gives me to say thank you very much for giving your time on the Britflix podcast. Yeah, well, I, I I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. In terms of stuff that I'm working on, I mean, like I said, the, the film that we wrote and Avi directed in April, Home Free, I'm excited about that. I'm always hesitant to say what's coming up next that I'm going to do because it, every time I do it, it never ends up being... No, like, no, don't. Know. I wouldn't want you to title something that's not greenlit. No, no, just... So, I mean, there's a lot of exciting things that I hope I get to make, um, some more than others, and mm. we'll, we'll see. Some of which have some in a roundabout ways, connections to the titles we talked about today. So.